So now we're recording and so we can go to the agenda. Um, so we're having uh, four uh, presentations and mine will be shorter, shorter. I don't know how I'm going to deal with the NSF thing. But anyway, uh, we've been very lucky that we were um, asked by Rakuten, uh, the, uh, the cloud operator, um, to maybe collaborate uh, to their initiative on autonomous networks that they want to start at ITU. Because of that, I asked Leon Wong, who's going to lead that uh, effort uh, to present uh, this morning or whatever time of the day it is. Then we have Professor Alex Gallis, whom a lot of you know from his, uh, I would say, stellar um, experience and uh, you know everything he did and he's going to review uh, 40 years of network programmability and I myself am looking forward to this because I met Alex last year when I was doing a keynote in a conference no not a keynote I was on a panel in a conference and Alex had a lot of very good uh, background on a ton of stuff that was done in the past in uh, network programmability and how maybe what is happening right now is going to be different from the outcomes of the previous uh, attempts at doing that. Uh, then uh, we're going to have a presentation from Edgar Ramos from Ericsson. Uh, it's a paper that we did together on semantic descriptor for intelligence services. Um, and um, as you know, in this group, there's been a lot of discussion on the use of discovery and data discovery uh, to allow network programmability and allow intelligent services inside networks. So I'm sure it's going to be, um, you know, it's probably going to give rise to a lot of uh, questions. Uh, then we have a paper from Bradeston in Cambridge. Uh, so I think we have a UK dominated meeting today. Uh, on multi-tenant programmable switches, which is work that he's done with Noah Zilberman, who uh, a lot of you know because she is a participant in this group and she's been very supportive. And then um, I don't have a lot of slides, but I will talk to you about a workshop that Henning Schultz, and I, well, a series of workshops that Henning Schultz of Columbia and I hosted on behalf of NSF uh, on the future of broadband research for the next five years. Uh, I can talk about it, but the report hasn't been published yet. So I'm going to be short, so probably not 20 minutes, but I think it's interesting for this group because it does it actually addresses a lot of the topics we've been discussing. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the ITF 110 preparation and the fact that we're on the last session of the last day. Um, this is an official um, IRTF um, um, interim meeting, so we have to follow the, the rules of IRTF in terms of uh, IPR and how to conduct ourselves in meetings. So I'm putting that. And so without more talking from myself, uh, Leon, are you online? I, I don't see who's online. Yes. I'm here. Okay, so uh, welcome, uh, Leon. Welcome to our group. And uh, I will stop sharing so you can start sharing. Thank you so much. Yes. That's perfectly. Good. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, having us here today to speak. Uh, we are the lucky ones to be able to speak here. So, good day, everyone. So, uh, to do it uh, ITU way, we'll say it uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. So, uh, here, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. So my name is Leon. Uh, I'm from Rakuten Mobile. 
So mm -hmm. together with me today, uh, we have Paul Harvey. Uh, he's our lead research scientist. So we belong to Rakuten Mobile's uh, innovation studio. So this is just a fancy name for uh, our research and innovation departments uh, for Rakuten Mobile. So, so thank you again for having us here today. So this quickly goes to what we want to talk about today. Uh, so uh, I just want to start by sharing uh, basically my perspective on the autonomous, ne autonomous network. So, so yeah, just just as aeroplanes uh, don't take us into space, uh, we don't believe that uh, existing technologies alone are enough to achieve the higher layers of autonomy. So. So in order, what, what you see here is basically where we're trying to give uh, everyone a bit of perspective. So, so I mean, we will not be able to reach the moon by trying to fly our plane higher. So what we, what, what we are trying to do here is basically, uh, basically to see how, how, how we can achieve, how we can achieve this, uh, autonomy. So. As as we as the role of human is reduced uh, in the higher layer, the challenges uh, the challenges that we face uh, become basically exponentially harder. So this is the reason that motivates motivates us to approach uh, <clears throat> uh, motivates our approach of uh, evolutionary driven autonomy. But we know that we know that we cannot achieve autonomy alone. Uh, so that's why we have been uh, forming tactical collaborations to work together and research on the necessary ideas and topics and technologies to achieve this. So, which is why we started a new initiative in ITU. So the focus group on autonomous, autonomous network. So I apologize for this boring slide. Uh, this is a very standard slides with too many words. Uh, I will explain briefly to everyone the overview. So just a quick background on ITUT. So ITU is uh, is the International Telecommunication Union, where the T at the end uh, stands for standardizations. So it's part of the UN family, uh, focusing on standards for telecommunication and information community, communication technologies. So within the family of ITU T, there is a unique structure of group, which is called the focus group, which is the, the, the group that we're talking to, about here today. So. Although, uh, as I explained earlier, ITUT is supposed to focus on standards, standardizations, but to accelerate uh, the study and works on specific areas, uh, so pre-standardization works can be done in focus group. So the concept of this focus group uh, is meant to be open to all, so it's free for every, free for everyone to join. So every, anyone can join from any organizations, whether you're you're, you're, you're part of uh, industry, you're part of operator, you're whether you're part of uh, academia, university, <clears throat> or you can, you, you can even be an individual expert that is interested to this topic. So anyone can basically join this, uh, this group. So, so a few of us, uh, Paul and me basically, so I'm enthusiastic about pushing this topic forward and creating an ecosystem to work on this topic together. So we pitched this idea to ITU, uh, somewhere end of last year, uh, with support from about 30 entities, a mix of industry, academia, uh, some universities, government bodies, and we <coughs> focus group uh, on autonomous network. So this focus group, uh, FGN, uh, will serve as an open collaboration platform for pre-standard study on autonomous network. So. This open platform will enable collaborations between uh, experts like you all here today, uh, across different spectrum. You can you can be from industry, academia, or you can be from SDOs, any anywhere. So allow us uh, allowing us to synergize the the right talent, knowledge, and experience to see how uh, we can achieve autonomous network together. So what FGAN, what what our group uh, will explore and study. Uh, it's basically, uh, we will we'll, we'll study the approaches on some key concepts, uh, such as uh, exploratory evolutions, real-time responsive experimentations, and dynamic ad adaptations. So I will cover them in the next <clears throat> So in achieving autonomous network, uh, we are looking to 
progressively uh, give more control and responsibility to the software. So which includes not just operations of the known, but also uh, adaptations to the unknown. So to structure our approach to this challenge, uh, our focus group will try and achieve this goal through basically these three key concepts here you see. So first one, exploratory evolution, and then real-time responsive experimentation, <coughs> and lastly, dynamic adaptation. So the first one is about, uh, to put it in simple words, the first one is about uh, making or creating logic. So the second one is about uh, how we validate it. And then the third one is the necessary tooling and technologies to apply the logic. So, uh, I mean, yeah, mm, logic might not be the right term. Uh, you can replace logic with uh, solutions like basically creating solutions, validating solutions, applying solutions. But but uh, depending on the solution, uh, situations, uh, I'm happy to hear uh, your opinions or suggestions uh, here. So quickly go into these key concepts. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the main questions uh, of autonomous operations is how to adapt to the unknown or unexpected. So for the purpose of basically addressing or improving a given situation. <laughs> so at the moment, such challenge requires a human being to be involved. So, and to craft a new or better approach using their creativity each time when something comes out. So our challenge uh, here is basically is how to achieve this with minimal human involvement. So uh, evolution, evolutionary computing represents a codifiable way to achieve uh, some form of creativity. So in other words, uh, evolutionary computing is a way to write down the process of creativity. <laughs> so, more concretely, is it, is it a way to explore, is a way to explore a large number of options in an efficient way. So evolution basically is the driver we use to create uh, new closer controllers. So how it works uh, is for another discussions, but we, uh, we are not the only people who are pursuing this line of thinking uh, as of now. So Google, Google has recently applied the same approach to enable the rediscovery of several machine learning technologies uh, by a software entity. So what you can see on the right side is basically an example from uh, AutoML0 by Google. So the end result of which was a better approach than is currently known to human for a particular problem. So NASA, NASA, basically, you see the space, space shuttle that we are trying to build. So NASA, um, just, uh, uh, NASA has used the same uh, evolutionary search, uh, similar evolutionary search techniques to design a radio antenna that were basically cheaper, and lighter, and more effective uh, than uh, than uh, human equivalents can produce. So, but this sounds great. I know, uh, yeah, it sounds like, the, the secret sauce and the slide of the holy grail, but 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 there are still a lot of challenge challenge to overcome. So so the questions uh, we are trying to ask ourselves like uh, how how long does it take? Uh, we don't have a million years to figure out for for this kind of emergence uh, behavior. So what is the right uh, what, what is the right form of evolution to use? Uh, can evolution be applied to all use cases? Probably not. Uh, maybe only well only few or maybe a handful, but maybe a lot generic cases as well. But but I think we, we can only figure it out. Uh, we can only answer all these questions uh, when we try it out uh, for real. So in simple words, uh, evolution, uh, this is about how uh, making or creating logic to improve operations of unknown situations or to adapt to the unknown. So, so now that we have the logic, so when it's created, uh, so how can we validate it? So this is where we reach the real-time responsive experimentations. So, so yeah, you can see the interesting visual how human test their ideas, so, so should machines. So if evolution creates a new closed loop controllers, for example, so experimentations uh, is, is the way that we ensure that they are fit for, for the purpose, uh, either through trial and errors, or generally validate them against the tasks they are supposed to perform. So this is also the way that, that we can provide reliability and trust uh, in the mechanisms that is uh, generating the, the controllers itself. 
So, so the experimentation we are talking about is actually a spectrum, uh, encompasses a spectrum of stuff. So, so from sanity checking, so the process of process of uh, statically checking controllers whether they are reasonable. For example, the critical path of this uh, controller is it too long or is it too short? The optimization controller can only turn on a, a light switch on and off, which make no sense if that's the case. So then we talk about the next one. We talk about simulations. Uh, how we can uh, using simulations, traces, or test bait to test the correctness or effectiveness of uh, closed loop controllers. Uh, or that uh, the new controller is uh, better than the current one or not. So on the other end of the spectrum, we have the canary testing. You see progressively larger integrations into the real production network. We, we, we want to see how we can do that as well, and how we want to push this to the real production network as well. So, so <clears throat> uh, the concept of such testing uh, has already been shown, for example, uh, the, I'm not sure, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with uh, the other uh, works from ITU uh, focus group on machine learning, so machine learning for 5G. So they, they, they have this framework for sandboxings which uh, touch upon this concept as well. So so it's nothing new, so it's nothing really new, or, or, but we are, we are trying to see how we can apply this in, in, in the sense of uh, autonomy. So, so, so there are still challenges that we are to, trying to to ask ourselves uh, specifically how how to uh, automatically construct experimentations for the merit of controllers. Uh, how how and to what extent can digital twins be used to create uh, experimentation environments? Uh, how to effectively uh, effectively create a testing environment that allows us to trust the AI created controllers, and what kind of safety measures? Must be in place to do uh, production canary testings, and then also uh, I think this uh, we have to ask ourselves uh, at what point is something considered validated, so so the, the trust level of the the, the things that is being created, so yeah so that brings us to the next one so so now we have the newly uh, new or cre newly created or improved logic, we validated it. Uh, the next questions we ask ourselves now is, uh, how can we apply it? How can we really realize it? So creating and validating new logics or solutions, but never being able to do anything with it is, well, basically, I guess, useless. So, so um, virtualizations and clouds, uh, yeah, you heard, you heard this a lot, has given a lot of flexibility in architecture and deployments, well, especially in the telco industry. Uh, yeah, we are doing a bit of catch up here. So, so augmented by these disaggregations of telco functions, uh, open architectures, uh, the open runs that you see, you heard a lot. So the, the open opportunity now presents uh, to how to dyna dy dy dynamically uh, adapt architectures to future environments, uh, future technologies, or future use, use cases. So now with this opportunity, uh, with other things, uh, what other things uh, we are trying to ask ourselves, what other things needs to be in place to enable machines to do this in state of humans? So to realize this dynamic adaptation. So, so what kind of technologies, what kind of interfaces, what kind of specifications, data models, ontology, taxonomies, semantics, yeah. So this, this, these are the questions we are asking ourselves. So, so, so imagine uh, now we have a closed loop controllers. Uh, everyone is trying to build. At least, at least everyone in the telco is trying to build a, a AI ML and enabled uh, closed loop uh, controllers. So now let's take a step back and see how these closed loop controllers can be decomposed into smaller functional building blocks. Uh, that's modularization, as you can see in the slides. So and that's nothing new as well. I think it's been discussed for for a long time. So now, now take one step uh, backward again, one more step backward. So we are asking how can we basically describe uh, these functional building blocks so that uh, not just for the sake of describing. So so we have you see we we want to we ask ourselves how we can describe these uh, blocks so that uh, it can be later consumed for evolutionary compositions. So in the first, we are talk about the creating the logic. So, so how can all these building blocks uh, uh, be composed like 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 Lego blocks? And then the 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 first the first actions the the first concept of the uh, the 
creating logics. How can they pick up all these different different blocks and see how you can uh, compose it and create basically new unknown controllers, just like what uh, NASA, uh, NASA did of creating a basically out of the world antenna that basically uh, it's just uh, if you if you Google the picture, the, the antenna shape is just out of this world that I, I maybe maybe at least for me I will not be able to think of that kind of design. So so this is this is pretty interesting. Uh, so so uh, I saw on the agenda as well the presentations by uh, Aga from Ericsson's on semantic descriptors for intelligence services. Uh, I think this is also very re relevant to this. So how we can describe a lot of different different intelligence services as well. Uh, yeah, so so these are the questions we are trying to ask ourselves and trying to address in the focus groups. So uh, also uh, <clears throat> uh, existing specification language, uh, the data models or taxonomies are, are these sufficient to realize uh, to 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 realize autonomous networks to to realize the, the evolutions needed to to achieve autonomous network. So so based on the the all the mirrors of use cases, so one thousand one use cases out there. Uh, existing interfaces, the protocols, the programming languages, uh, is it sufficient rich and expressive enough to achieve uh, autonomous networks? So, so yeah, uh, it's a lot of questions. Uh, so we are trying to ask, we, we, we don't have all the answers uh, and we don't know what other, basically we, there might new things that is required, but we don't know at this point that we need them at all. Uh, so, so how and yeah, these are the all this basically how how this can be applied to all the use cases at this point. So so this this these are all the things that we are trying to ask ourselves. So so with this with this all these questions in mind and this interesting topic in mind, uh, well uh, we happily went on to have our first uh, meeting uh, last week. So. Uh, we received around 35 contributions for the uh, for the focus group uh, first meeting. So uh, so basically, contribution means uh, input documents or papers or anything to to discuss various topic that uh, people from different backgrounds uh, they want to discuss about. So the, the meeting itself, we had about uh, 200 over registrations. We have uh, around 100 participants each day. We spent uh, lasted for three days. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, what I want to say, uh, highlight here is basically uh, the people, the crowd is uh, is a balanced crowd of people. So so it's not heavily tutored to any specific uh, spe uh, uh, spectrum of people. It's like it's not heavily tutored to the operators. It's not heavily tutored to the industry side, nor it's not heavily tutored just on the research side. So so you can see we we have we have a well balanced people from operators, industry. Uh, government bodies, uh, Ministry of Communications, and so on, and standardizations, standardizations uh, bodies. So we also have a lot of uh, universities. We have a lot of professors uh, yeah, coming and talk about this top this topic, and there's also a lot of uh, research organizations. So, so we we invited uh, IRTF's NMRG as well, uh, which gave us a very very good uh, retrospective view of the autonomous network. And, and basically the challenges that they see uh, that's in the head. I think this is very, uh, very good for the group. So, so, so out of this first meeting, we, we form, we really try to have, we have a uh, work group structure to discuss uh, all these questions that we have in mind in a more structured way. Uh, I will not deep dive into this today. Uh, it's a bit boring part of this is, so, but yeah, we can discuss this in further more if you're interested. So, yeah, a lot of these uh, questions that that I ask is uh, are basically research questions. So, and, and we are here today uh, in this meeting to ask uh, everyone here in this meeting, uh, everyone here, if if any of this uh, strike a chord, if you think uh, you are working on topic related to us. We are happy to sit down and discuss, basically discuss more. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, maybe you can help us to answer some of these questions. So, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, so for the standard closing, 
for more information, uh, please visit our website. Uh, you can join our mailing list. Uh, in, from from our website, uh, you, we have a mailing list, so you can join the mailing list. Uh, uh, to 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 join our discussions, we have weekly meetings as well. The the agenda, the the timing for the weekly meeting is there. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Uh, talk to us anytime. Uh, we are so. This uh, I just say. We we hope uh, not 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 from just Rakuten Mobile, but we from the focus group itself. Uh, we hope to collaborate and learn more from uh, Coin RG in the future. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, Looks like we have a question from Dirk. Yes, actually, I was going to say uh, we're gonna have a lot of time for questions. Okay. Um... Yeah, thanks a lot, Leon, for um, your presentation. Um, I, um, I have one question. So, as far as I remember, um, so in autonomous networking or self-organized networking has been around for quite some time. So, I remember, it, for example, in the phase where the research for LTE was done, so self-organized networking for interference management, these kind of things. And so, I wondered a bit. Um, what is um, now so uh, new from your perspective? So at that time, it was almost always, um, always seen as a yeah kind of management uh, approach, and um, so I'm I'm kind of wondering what is the new research in in your point of view, and so do do you see any connection to um, the computing in the network um, topic that um, this group is is uh, researching? Thank you, Doug. Uh, yes, it's nothing new. <laughs> we, no, the, we, I don't want to say that, nothing new. I'm just wondering. So, what is the? So, I guess maybe machine learning or SDN could be new elements. But just wondering. Yeah, yeah. No, no. You are you are exactly you are exactly correct. It's it's nothing new. Don't don't tell the telco people. But yeah, it's nothing new. <laughs> but but the, but the thing is, uh, like I say, so the telco we we. From at least from from a operator point of view, so so we, we did a lot of catch up. So, uh, what happened here is basically, uh, I'm not trying to boost here, but basically, uh, Rockland Mobile we we managed to deploy. I it was I don't know how, but we managed to deploy a sort of end-to-end -end cloud native uh, telco network. So this basically unblocks a lot of uh, new opportunities. Uh, so autonomous network in computing itself is not nothing new, but but in telco itself, this um, this 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 creates new opportunities to 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 look at this area. So 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 basically, it open up new new doors how we can achieve this uh, in telco and and basically, yeah, uh, it's nothing new, but it's something something that something is something new for for the for the telco industry and and this is something that we can actually uh, I think the the telco telco industry can actually benefit a lot from this uh, considering the, the the massive amount of uh, <clears throat> the, the massive amount of uh, devices and things we need to to manage now with 5g taking into place IOTs and everything so so like I say it's nothing new but uh, to from a telco's perspective this is something that that can actually uh, Bring us brings a lot of uh, benefits to the industry. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Uh, I have a question. This is Eve Schuler from Intel, and um, I guess my question, Leon. First, thank you uh, uh, as well for a very interesting talk. Um, I know that you said that you don't think that there's anything new, but um, when I, you know, wearing the the glasses that are, you know, through the lens of CoinRG, I wonder if, you know, speaking to your point that maybe this is an introduction to the telcos, it raises the question of given the networks and the infrastructure that exists already, um, if the deployment of the compute and the, I mean, so we, you didn't talk that much about the compute. You talked kind of indirectly about the composition, which I do think 
has some relevance to um, the activities going on in um, the 1DM world where there's a working group in the ITF called AS, ASDL. AS, Karsten, please correct me, but the A semantic definition format, ASDF, um, uh, which does look at um, a language, if you will, um, for um, how things interact with each other. And so it would be interesting to understand how those sorts of function blocks come together. But um, additionally, some of those properties of those objects are um, the kinds of operations they support in their interactions. And, and for that, I do think that, that there may be um, not just, you know, what operation to support, but where to run those operations, given that there are many that the location of what it is you're trying to do may not be on a single host, that it's potentially across many collections of resources. So uh, I know I'm rambling here a bit, but I, um, I'm hoping that the conversation going forward um, in the new ITU group um, will comprehend that kind of discussion. And so you ha have you seen hints of that um, or have you seen um, organization, other organizations um, that um, are touching on those kinds of questions about where to run the compute that's going to help with the evolution and the composition um, that it isn't just a centralized activity? Thank you, Eve. Uh, well, uh... If I understand correctly, yes, uh, we have collaborations, uh, basically on edge computing. So we have uh, <clears throat> we have people from universities trying to work, working on the distributed computing as well on this. So again, uh, again, uh, if you think this is, I know it's very new. <laughs> we will yeah, join yeah. in. Yeah. Well, again. Uh, I don't I don't have all the answers. So if you think this is something worth pursuing uh, in, in terms of autonomous work, I, I mean, this this is the something that, uh, worth pursuing together. Um, we are happy to sit down and see how we can work out on this area. So if it sounds interesting. Uh, so but yeah, that absolutely does. Thank you for coming in and sharing. Yeah, I was I, I was going to us. say uh, I was going to say that I think that aspect would be a common interest for uh, both uh, Corn RG and, and the ITU group, and uh, I think we've agreed to uh, to talk about it. So, and we should continue. Um, so, we're we're now uh, going into. Uh, um, are there any other questions, or uh, should we move to the next presentation? Uh, other questions can go to the list. Uh, um, um, Leon and your colleague, who I don't remember the name, uh, please join the, the mailing list, the mailing list, because if there's other questions, it could go there. And there could be uh, more discussion on the list also about how these two initiatives um, um, overlap and um, could eventually um, uh, yeah, collaborate or actually move together and towards a few common uh, common goals, uh, research if, goals. If, if, sorry, uh, Paul, I'm the other guy with Leon. Thank you very much for having us. And just to echo what Leon's comments were, I completely think that there's overlap between these two areas. Well, we do have some efforts on edge computing. The compute and the network especially had to take advantage of the existing infrastructure and all the necessary mechanisms, and, you know, uh, well, the mechanisms to achieve that is a strong overlap, not just as uh, was pointed out by Eve for where to run these evolutionary computings or any other approach we use, but also for the use cases and services in the network themselves. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, 100%. Well, uh, it, and I think it goes back to uh, there, some of you may know the, uh, the EU is also looking at creating uh, operating systems for IoT distributed networks and uh, you know, we've had this idea that a network now is much more like a, a computer board than a uh, a series of telephone interconnections. So, 
Um, yeah, I think there's going to be uh, potential uh, cool work to be done. Uh, moving on, actually, it's interesting because the next presentation is from Alex and uh, uh, Leon uh, started some of the things saying there's nothing new. Uh, well, I think there are things new, but Alex will tell us what is not new and what could be new. So Alex, please uh, start your presentation. Hello. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Very good. Okay, my name is Alex uh, Gallis um, from University College London, obviously in London, UK. And thanks a lot for this uh, opportunity to make some presentation about this important topic of programmability. It just happens that I have published uh, more or less the same number of papers, uh, research papers in programmability and autonomicity. So if I will try to make more links between the two areas. However, just to start it, autonomicity is uh, 10 years younger than programmability in networks. It's 1971, the first good paper on it. Uh, both these areas, I have to say, they didn't reach yet the maturity which is necessary to go into commercial networks yet. But hopefully, the next period will allow that to do it. For my presentation is mainly to draw some lessons from the past uh, research and engineering activities uh, and to avoid pitfalls for the future period as it applies mainly to programmability but also to autonomicity. Um, I have a substantial number of content which I'm going to go very quickly through and not to dwell with in too many topics. However, I'll concentrate on some suggestion about what could be new and important for the future. I will go through uh, some sort of uh, content list, starting with very important, the key con concepts, the terms used for the last 40 years in this field. And I'll conclude with some uh, suggestion for the future. Now, the key terms in this area are related to programmability, which is, in simple terms, is, uh, it refers to executable code, which is activated or injected in some sort of computing execution environment in network elements of different kinds. It could be any network elements in the wireless or wireline access, core, edge, and even space which means that it's quite a substantial type of uh, facility which allow new network functions to be activated on demand and managed and changed on demand. So it's a very powerful technique. Uh, however, it has to be anchored in a lot of security uh, environment in order not to allow uh, is such a code to create uh, havoc or uh, problems to the networking in general or in particular to some parts of it in any form or shape. So the two parts are absolutely hand by hand. No one would use programmability if uh, security are not extremely highly defined architecturally as well as implementation wise. Very importantly is to look at the concept of in-network computing and programmability is the fact that uh, it allows definitely the network elements to dynamically be changed. However, this also creates opportunity to link it with the network services, either one way or the other way. In such a way that practically making the network services being network aware and the other way around, something which is important in these days to minimize the uh, enormous costs which exist in terms of dealing with uh, with these subjects for the operators and others. Uh, and these are basically the terms used, maybe different uh, terminology. I, I, I looked at the coin terms, and also it's the line of this part. Uh, and uh, we can move forward. Now, there are a number of lessons already which I want to draw your attention. Uh, 
in the past, network programmability were also hand in hand with developing relatively new platforms, many software platforms. This is quite expensive to do, tricky to organize, and even more complicated to um, create a big user group for it. Uh, as such, it's a time to look at the programmability to, in terms of piggybacking on the massive trend now, which is softwareization, which is happening irrespective of programmability or autonomicity. A lot of new platforms are dealing with components and system issues at the software level, and obviously uh, programmability or, and autonomicity is about software. So it's an opportunity to piggyback in this sense. And that's the first lesson take advantage. There is no need to invent massive platforms which an operator will accept. And I'm pretty sure that uh, you understand that this is quite a big uh, undertaking. And there is no need to do it, provided that programmability and autonomicity, in particular, these two elements, could be added and tested at existing, let's say, successful platform. The second uh, very important lessons from the past is that sometimes it's good to not to look at the problem from the past. Because by the time you solve them, they are already, the solution are obsolete, uh, the situation is moving. Currently, the industry is moving towards other next generation networks, in particular two types, which are interrelated, which is network 2030, as it is specifying details as the architecture level by ITUT, or a subset of it is 6G, a wire line uh, part, which is also fully architected so far in proposition terms with white papers from different, uh, uh, different sources of magnitude. But clearly these are new networks where the requirements are different. And some of these are listed here, which involves stringent delivery for KPIs, guarantees of different kind, uh, uh, autonomicity, programmability, and many others. And for this is an opportunity to, to look at these problems related to the specification of the generation networks, in particular the two which I mentioned, which are overlapping anyway, 6G and Network 2030, and concentrate on this as a way to move forward. The last, but not the least, actually probably the most important lesson from the past is the fact that uh, programmability in particular requires a change in the network devices. And as such, if you propose something to massively change the current devices, the cost of doing that is prohibited. And therefore, as a result, any solution will not be usable. So it's a time to look always for a delivery mechanism for such programmabilities, and for it's important to do it. One of the systemic ways to is now everywhere, it's about slicing, which is now fully researched and a lot of system organized, and in such a way that programmability based on a, a slice has a better chance to be deployed, bearing in mind that for another slice, there could be other techniques applied and different and so on, and uh, in this way, you don't uh, assume that uh, it will be deployed uh, at large, which is impossible. Another, that, that's a three lessons which are applicable to both this area, autonomicity and, uh, and uh, programmability. Now, in the past, in programmability times, there were tons of research results. The bottom corner from the left includes, let's say, activities where millions of papers were produced, for example, a routine, packet forwarding, but also on the other side, node operating systems, programming languages, and so on. The blue centers are more or less uh, relatively new, 10 years or so, five years or so, new models, which tend to help the process. On one side, on a computation side, you have uh, network level operating system facilities and continuous from central cloud to edge cloud uh, uh, compute. On the other side, on communication, you have uh, network functions control, 
slicing control, KPI controls, and autonomistic control. But they are converging and they're moving. There are a lot of uh, results on this blue part, a lot, which I'm going to go through quickly. But one uh, thing which I would like to stress is that there is no single model or a single solution which fits all. And that applies to both this area. We have to be careful to look at other things which will be interworkings as well. Now, what are the key results, mainly from standard groups? One of the early ones, which uh, quite early, in, is called Project P1520, I probably P1520, and uh, it's uh, more than 20 years old, but it's the first one which defines a way in which um, precursor of the existing today um, DevOps, autonomic DevOps, which is applied to network or service chaining. But in principle, it, it created uh, a suggestion to a number of interfaces via which network services could be composed from pre-compiled building blocks, which are composed in, in a particular logic and then deployed. So the idea is more or less the same like uh, in today's uh, DevOps, but uh, the original one is this. And this is a substantial way to move forward on this subject, even a level of programmability. The second one, very importantly, it's uh, an IATF forces group, which I noticed that Evangelios is on the line, just was one of the people working on this. And uh, that group, it's relatively old as well, nearly 20 years old, but it reached a level of success in terms of proposing a separation between forwarding and control elements in the network elements. And this is now, in my view, applied to most, if not all, the current network devices, although not using the protocols and methods proposed by forces. But it helped the lower level environment, if you want to put it like this, to move forward in terms of what you need to be looked at. Another, probably the most prominent uh, area in this field is about uh, related to active networks or programmer networks. And uh, it's an area which started in the United States, but it was quickly uh, covering the whole world and more or less suggesting that there is a need for decoupling network service and applications through network APIs from the node APIs of the node devices and to use some execution environment, the place where you, you execute computation practically into it. And uh, that could be very near to the node or very far from the node, it doesn't matter, but to allow this to allow a level of programmability. So I, it's quite a lot of work in this field. There were more than 50 big platforms available for experimentations in this area. Last but not the least, an important uh, standard result is about SDN. Probably the most important part of SDN is about the fact that it allows a level of programmability of the flows in the network. Currently, in my view, as a whole, it's not necessarily uh, very successful. It's more or less dying and will be replaced over all those other things. But at least this should be mentioned. Now, if you look to the whole scenario of all the current research results, hopefully I didn't miss too many, I put them into one slide. They contain more than 50 separate elements representing research with multiple res research paper published, experimental platforms uh, developed and tested, if you want, and many more. And they are related to different parts of the way in which programmability could be looked at. And I think that all of them are important, and uh, that also, also proves that one solution doesn't solve all, and they are related to add on to the let's say, the operating systems, either to the ones which are open source or the ones which are proprietary. Uh, data plane devices in particular, uh, many such things, and execution environments. 
different type of execution variables. There is no single way where computation could be attached, either and placed near the node or very far from the node. At the bottom, you have a little schematic about potential, uh, let's say, blueprint for programmable devices, and uh, which could be applied to access core and edge in particular, with a variety of uh, possibilities. However, uh, some of this, uh, let's say, research survey in detail were part of a book which was dedicated to programmability of network, which I published some time ago. I updated this slide based on other things, but uh, just a, a, a little bit of a warning. That book has around 600 pages. It's a research book. However, 60% or more of pages are dedicated to security, uh, showing that this is absolutely essential to uh, offer a level of confidence to anybody who wants to program networks and to allow the operators to do it. Sometimes, uh, this is uh, over overlooking it. Autonomicity is the same applies to the same subject. Now, what uh, are my proposal? Alex, um, do you have still uh, a lot of because um, I think this this could be a, a full day tutorial, and we could think about it. Do, do you still have a lot of material? Um, no, or? I have only two slides left. Okay. So, what would be my suggestion about taking this into account, and maybe that could be taken further, based on the four, uh, let's say, lessons learned from the past. Number one, it's still time to look at forwarding plane programmability and up, which is more or less an attempt to re-engineer the IP layers. In particular, the user-defined networking, which allows the packet header to be changed to allow programmability from the user point of view to happen. And this is clearly needed for deterministic forwarding, as well as uh, attempting to replace best effort with uh, some level of high-precision networking service, as required by the next networks. Another group of uh, management-related uh, 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 challenges for this program is listed here. I'm not going to go through it, but a few things which are important. Triggering programmability in a network is as important as a, was a network is. So the two should be hand in hand. Both will create problems or solutions, and without them, Together, they will have massive, uh, massive uh, issues. Now, my last uh, suggestion is to look also how to apply the program to the multi-domain issues. Given the fact that the current networks are multi-domains, many operators, and within an operator you have multiple uh, domains. So for, this is absolutely essential. And this scheme, this diagram shows that programmability and autonomicity could be put in helping these uh, multi-domain issues to be resolved. Now, what are my conclusion remarks, which I'm not going to put in place too much, but one of it is important. It's, it's a time to move, in my view, uh, network computation and programming techniques to solve problems which are now identifying new requirements in the next generation of networks as a way to be accepted. Obviously, there are some benefits which are described here, and also uh, it will help the network services to explore. So that concludes my short presentation, which I hope that also links to the previous uh, question from the previous presenter. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very thank you very much. Um, I, I this time for maybe a few questions. If no, nobody else has one, I do. Um, I saw well. I saw you were mentioning Net Net twenty thirty, which has been uh, mentioned in in many IRTF uh, fora before, and I think everybody uh, took notice of it. Uh, my question, however, is that. <clears throat> I think that, and I hope the Rakuten people are still online. Well, Paul is there. Is um, what 
One thing we tried to do in COIN is not have that much of a uh, operator focused um, and look at it more as a functionality of networking in general and also to encourage what I call the new operators, uh, the people like Rakuten who come from the uh, the data centers and the uh, the cloud infrastructure more than the traditional uh, operator in infrastructure. Um, it, it was also one of my criticism for, for Net 2030, by the way. Um, and I understood why in the context of Net 2030, but I think us, we are not uh, linked to uh, any operator or any company. And I would like to have your opinion, Alex, uh, how you could, you know, I, I will put your slide as, as interesting and very good tutorial background. But how would you see this evolution again when you stop thinking of the traditional operator network, but much more a number of processing nodes that are connected and are used to uh, really, really uh, deal with this new data-driven world we're living in? Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this. I can answer. It's already answered in my presentation, if you pay attention, but I'll repeat it. A lot of activities done in the last 40 years, and in particular in the last period, vis-a-vis -vis of how to improve programmability for clouds, computing, and so on. The techniques are excellent, but uh, the, at the end of the day, the proof is in a pudding, namely the techniques that we used for real or realistic network uh, developments. And uh, it doesn't matter uh, who is going to use them, but they need to be put in a lot of waste of good ideas and platforms where with the fact that they didn't think in terms of the fact that they need to be used. And who has by used by the network designers and developers of new network functions, also cloud functions, and to be put in place uh, by operator to be managed properly. Without this full part, uh, some technology developments are uh, useful, but uh, has only a small uh, longevity. So for the warning is, each, if you want to put it simple, uh, each of the coin drafts or activities should also cover explicitly the one which will be deployed easily and used easily in a network or cloud. Just a new technology or new research on technology is just the first step, which may not be sufficient to convince other people to move forward. Therefore, so that's basically the answer. For Network 2030 was not used only from the operating point of view. It's also a list of uh, new characteristics which need to be achieved. But above, the same applies to 6G networking, which I'm I'm also uh, starting to understand better as I participated to, to a network architecture description of the 6G, probably the most, the best in town, part of the 6G uh, flagship. And they are basically needed new characteristics which cannot, are not available today. So these are the problems to be attacked first, which will have a better chance to be successful to be taken by the full life cycle of the development of network functions. Uh, thank you uh, for this for this uh, answer. Uh, and yes, G, uh, it's very funny. Uh, Edgar, who's on that call, and I were talking about it a few days ago. Uh, Paul, you have a question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, uh, for an interesting presentation. My background is actually programmability for heterogeneous distributed systems. Uh, so it was really nice to see a lot of familiar names and things popping up. Um, and I think I agree. And then to, to blend that with the, the chair's comment to, to bring this to a conclusive point, I think it's an interesting time. Uh, we've all heard about the virtualization of all the different networking functionality to turn telcos into telco clouds. And at least the way Rakuten's looking at it is quite like the chair point that is, it is a collection of distributed system or distributed elements bringing together to operate the network with the caveat that you still need to provide all the connectivity that's happening. But as you move more towards software-based systems, 
all these interesting questions that are being asked is that what is the right way to represent it? What is good research and how can we use this to effectively operate? Of course, I speak from the operator perspective, not to plug it too much, but I think that's what Leon was getting about is like in the autonomous network focus group, that's the place where we're looking to try to ask these questions. And because the truth is no one knows, right? We talk about autonomous networks, no one knows really what it means. Um, and it's a, an opportunity to bring all the different perspectives to the table, put it on in front of everyone and say, well, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Um, and what are the wonderful ideas from research we can take and apply? And what are the ter terrible ones that we throw away? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think this idea of how do we program these things in the right way for the domain in which they're supposed to operate is a, a very important part of that conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, we will uh, move other questions to the, the list if there are some. Uh, the next uh, presenter um, is, ah, I remember my um, agenda. So now um, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm loading it. Okay, next one is Alex. I was wondering, I think we kept, we kept the best, the best the best for the last. No, I, I thank you, Radistan, for your your patient. Uh, next one is Edgar from uh, Ericsson. And again, like um, um, Leon was, was mentioning, uh, there could be some link to what he's doing. Uh, for people who are asking uh, what is the, the goal of today's presentation, uh, presentations, they're, they're a little bit, I would say, a dusting of a ton of different topics that were uh, addressed uh, on the list and in previous um, uh, presentations and uh, in previous meetings. And I think it was the start of this new model uh, modality that we want to have, which is more focused on, on papers, presentation, and less on drafts. And uh, we will continue that at the uh, at the IETF as it's coming. And I think you have to to bear with us that uh, we're starting this new model. So uh, of course we're going to have to you know tune it to to the um, audience. So Edgar, um, again uh, for people, it is not. I, I'm the co-author of that paper. It is not exactly about computing in a network, but is it presents something that is very important for computing in a network which is finding what you need and finding it in a way that you can actually share it with other people and using a common language to essentially be able to share that information so edgar please yes thank you Maria Jose. Uh, let me see if share my screen So hopefully you can see now my slides. Yes, thank you. So uh, yes, as uh, Mary just said, as, as said, uh, this was uh, part of a work that um, I have been doing together with, with her and uh, also a couple of other uh, authors, Tim Schneider from uh, the University of Alto, who is now in, in, in the Netherlands back, and Bin de Mester, who is uh, uh, from the Ghent University in Belgium, who had worked a lot also with uh, semantic descriptions uh, of functions. So then the idea was like, um, how can we actually do something that uh, could serve uh, also for the IoT, uh, IoT or, and not only try to um, do something that, that it's on, only for, let's say, machine learning in general in cloud. So basically, this is where the networking aspect comes into play. So since there is IoT devices, so the IoT device is going to be connected. So what I'm going to talk is a little bit about, uh, first of all, what are these uh, services and why they, they are important for IoT? Uh, then second, uh, how we came out with this kind of taxonomy of describing these services. And then finally, um, I will go very fast towards one, one example using a, a very well-known uh, convolution network called MobiNet. Um, 
So first of all, some, some introduction is about, um, we have been talking that in order to modify or, or let's say handle intelligence devices, it would be needed, and not only in devices, I mean in infrastructure in general, in the edge. So we would need to, to add some sort of abstraction that you can actually, you could actually operate to. So that attract abstraction would have their own layer. Today that we found it together with the application. So basically every application have an API, have some services, and then it might have a machine learning model, for example. And then that all is packed in an application. The down, down thing of this is that if you want to reuse that model, let's call it a system, a model for a speech recognition, and you have other applications in the same device or in the same system, you basically cannot reuse it because unless that application has an API that explicitly allows you to reuse that, that model, then you cannot actually use it for something else. The other thing is that uh, it's very tied to how the application is built. It means that interoperability is an issue. So if you want to actually change suddenly something from that intelligence, you cannot do it because it is so much embedded in that application that you cannot really uh, modify it. So then an idea is that can we actually create this abstraction layer that we can call it um, intelligence layer if we want, or uh, we have been talking here in COIN before of, about the, the data, the, the data layer. Uh, or I mean, we can give it any name, but the idea is that this layer would be basically very similar to an operative system. You, when you um, are writing an application, you don't think in the application how to send a packet over TCP. You basically line of code that allows you to send that uh, request to an operative system, and the operative system take care of delivering those packets or that object. Uh, it will do the segmentation, it will do everything for you. So why we cannot do something similar here in the devices where we actually abstract this layer of intelligence, where we have all these services like recognition, prediction, anomaly detection, or even generation of synthetic data that the applications could ask hey, I want some uh, uh, recognition of, of the camera image that I have here. And then you get an answer. This is uh, uh, an elephant or uh, this is a, a, a traffic sign and so on. So then this is the idea. The intelligence services would be uh, this kind of uh, exposed models, AI models that would be running in this kind of abstraction layer called intelligence layer. Now, but if we think about this kind of model, when we are saying that we put things in the devices and then the devices become suddenly intelligent, we have to think about um, the context that, that the IoT has uh, as such uh, with, when it's trying to, to address a use case. And also we have to think about IoT as a device, uh, uh, heterogeneity as such, and then also the context where actually you want to solve or how you want to solve this problem. So if we start with the problem solving, so let's say that you want to do a recognition of something. So for example, an apple. So that would mean that um, you will have basically uh, different use cases where you could use this kind of recognition each of the use cases will have their own requirements. So if you have, a, for agriculture, most probably you want to know if this apple is sick or is it uh, actually healthy. Uh, for the supply, supply chain, you want to know if this is really an apple or is an orange. You didn't want to know anything else, but that you can sort it in the right place. And for diagnostics, uh, it might be that you want to know if uh, this is um, uh, growing, uh, let's say, uh, accordingly to the um, to the standards that were supposed to, to have this kind of apple. Then another problem that you have is uh, where you are running this software. So it might be that you might be running it in a data center and you don't have any constraints uh, of, of uh, hardware. 
but it might be that you have latency problems if you are running it in, 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 in the edge and then you need to actually bring the results. So you might have to move that model closer to where the action is happening. For example, the brakes of your car, you wouldn't like that the uh, decision is going to a data center somewhere in US when you are driving in Germany and then deciding if you should stop or not. You would like that that processing happens in your car. And uh, also the different type of processing environments might be more complicated or less complicated according to um, what is the capabilities of those devices. And finally, the solution context is like, how does it look, uh, the algorithm or whatever you are using in order to, um, to do this recognition? So can you recognize a apple from the smell? Probably yes. Can you recognize an apple from a picture or from the shape? or from just from the color. So then the idea is that the, the solution uh, space is also quite wide. So you could actually have solutions that is not only a picture, like be what you would expect. Um, then the, the, the thing is that why you want to have this is because when you are creating, let's say um, systems like in a smart home, where you are having an application developer building applications on top of your system. And when we are talking about a home, it's something that is expected to last 100 years. And then you have a speech recognition uh, service for that. And then imagine that, can you, I don't know, change that system depending on uh, what is needed for the persons that are gonna live there? It might be that I already have train in a speech recognition system. Why I cannot use that one instead of the one that the, maybe the application developer has a deal with? Can I interoperate that service and say like, you know, uh, instead of uh, having this, uh, um, I don't know, uh, Marcus, I would like to use Billy because Billy, uh, is, I have been, I have it in all my devices and, and it really understand my English. So it's perfect for me. Or it might be that you are Maria and you want to have Alex because it has an excellent Spanish version of a speech recognition. Um, also, I mean, for the, for the application developers themselves, it's quite nice because they don't have to care what would be this uh, service, uh, um, service that is being connected with their software. But then this connection, how you actually map what the person is talking to what the system should do. So that is a semantic problem. And there is where we're trying to, to address it with this solution. Um, another thing is, uh, as I was saying, there are software dependencies from the solution. So many times they, they have been, um, they have been written in, in some programming language or they have an a execution environment that's the one for the model that, that is provisioned to you. And then also there could be hardware dependencies due to either uh, acceleration, because you will require this kind of um, a more uh, specific soft, uh, hardware for, for doing the, the instructions um, uh, execution faster, or then uh, memory, or then sometimes also even network connectivity. Then another thing to take in account is the policies. Um, not the whole story of intelligence comes from what the, the device is supposed to do, but also what are the business relationships behind those? And then it might be that you have certain requirements from security, from networking, and from performance, and other requirements like, well, I want my bananas to be 50 degrees the whole time they have been in the logistic chain. So how these kind of policies can populate all the way down to the devices so that they can understand what part of that policy corresponds to me. And uh, that's another topic of, uh, of, of uh, research on looking how these semantics should be expressed and then populated all the way down in the stack. Um, then if we talk about intelligence service, we can think of intelligence services as having data that is input, it is processed like any, any, any system, and then it's, it's actually output. Then this input, we can think about multiple contexts that this input can have. So let's say that one uh, context, the data is coming from the device. Another context could be that the data is being feeded by an external system, or the data could be fetched 
from a pop subscribe uh, uh, system. And the same thing happened with the output. The output could be that, well, um, this is um, a result that I'm getting every, um, I don't know, every 50 milliseconds. And then this, the other stream might be results that are consolidated over one day. So then you could have actually multiple meanings of the same data that you, your system is capable of producing. And the same thing, the meaning from the data that is being in, input. Then another thing is that uh, we could define in these uh, streams of data something that we call tensors in the, in the machine learning world is well known, this word tensor, which is basically trying to address a multiple domain that one data uh, object could have. So one, one example is a picture. So if you have a picture, you will have a RGB uh, matrix and those will be atomic objects. So you will, hit, you will have the, the, the blue, the red, and the, and the um, um, green um, values. And then they are uh, together with, uh, let's say, uh, the picture, um, what is the resolution? And then they have a matrix that, that make uh, uh, compose this kind of data. And then also in the output, you might have similar things. For example, for machine learning, Functions you might have a, a classification matrix coming out of that of that uh, uh, intelligence service. So the idea we have with these um, semantic descriptors is how can we uh, how how we can describe data and describe these services that is being input in one hand and also what is supposed to be doing. So what I'm presenting you is basically how we have thought that this data input and output could be uh, described semantically in, in a structure. Then this has a total, I mean, total one-to-one -one match to any of the data models that already exist. So basically you could actually map any of the data models to something that could fit into this kind of uh, uh, format. So it's not something perpendicular to anything. It's, it's, it's something that can be adapted. And also, they might be domain ontologies and vocabularies and even custom things that, that can be adapted in this kind of uh, uh, data structure. And the idea is that whenever you get these services, you can use them to create pipelines. So you can take these services and then put them together and create more complex services. And these more complex services might be even customized with certain uh, transformation so that you, you can um, serve uh, other services or even store the data, for example. Um, then these transformation functions could be also something that uh, resembles a service, but it will be much more simple. So it will be something uh, that, that basically do a service for the service that is, is making or preparing the data so that the service can be used. Um, this is what we come, as a taxonomy. It, it, here, of course, it looks like it's a lot of stuff. But then uh, what do I want to just uh, highlight from here is maybe the, the left part, where mostly all of the things are, are being uh, instantiated as some kind of domain-specific description in ontology, which means that you can describe the service in the same way but using multiple domains. So you could have an ontology that it, it, it specify things for, um, I don't know, uh, gardening. And then you could have a vocabulary for gardening. And then you could actually explain that service from the gardening perspective, if it's a service that applies for that. But then it might be that you have a similar uh, this, uh, ontology that, that could describe things uh, for a, a data center, and then there you can actually do these kind of abstractions from a data center perspective. But the same service could be described, then use it that different domain. And then here we have uh, multiple um, uh, entities. I, I will start maybe with the um, abstract classes uh, very fast. So then the, the, this was what I just talked about, the domain specific. And then there are these unique classes. So that's something that cannot be repeat. So in some of the services, you can have this uh, can can have this kind of many domains, and there are certain things which are unique. Some of these things that are unique is who made this service. 
and uh, also it, it another another thing that is you need is is the implementation it's missing some some letters here um, but then the idea is that this um, service has a version and then this version solves one or many problems and then these problems are also domain specific uh, but um, it, the problem is described uh, mainly as a goal so what is the goal of this service what it try to 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 solve and it might be that is a uh, apple recognition for somebody else is fruit recognition for somebody else is just object recognition but then what is the actual objects that are being recognized that's a different thing um, then uh, here i am mentioning policies although we didn't do work in policies yet but we think that the the, the service will have uh, in the future this kind of descriptive policies that apply to this service and also maybe to the data that the service is, is being processing. But then this is for future work. Uh, the other part is the implementation, and the implementation has a lot of things. So here is where we see the data structure part, where the, you have the streams, then you have the data, the data tensors, and then the data objects. And then all of them has a data label which can be annotated in any domain. Another thing we have is the data sets, because the data set is data that not necessarily is uh, being input or output, but is necessary to understand that data service. For example, training data. What was the data set that was used for training a machine learning model? Or what is the data set used for the mapping of the post-processing of that, uh, um, of that um, service, if it's a classification uh, um, algorithm? Then if there are some dependencies, so it is needed if you require any execution environment or you require a specific hardware. And then here we have the pipeline, which uh, basically is a composition of uh, these uh, streams and, 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 and other intelligent services. And then we call something atomic service to those services that can be, can be um, uh, orchestrated in the same pipeline together. So, I will uh, go far. Uh, Edgar, um, yeah. are you at the end? Because you're way over yes. time. Uh, I'm over time already. OK, <laughs> then uh, let me just show that we did something similar like that with this model mobile net, which what it does is basically uh, object recognition. And we, um, I I'm not going to go through the details, but basically uh, we, we were able to um, delete and then have some um, for example, domain-specific uh, uh, descriptors. They are machine learning uh, neural network methods here uh, that were used for the implementation description, for example. And then also there were certain annotations for the data data labels, like for example, how to describe the, the RGB channels uh, using um, just basic RDF and then some, some uh, other domains like EXIF uh, that are used for JPEG, for example. And um, then we also put on top of that a pre-processing pre uh, uh, pre -processing, uh, function that was basically doing a normalization of the data, and we added to the model with the pipeline, um, with the pipeline uh, feature. But well, uh, to conclude, so the idea of this semantic description is, is basically trying to provide an, um, some kind of structure. So and describe these intelligent services in a way that can be interoperably understood. The devices need to have the full domains, the, everything, all the whole information, but the platforms, which can have access to any kind of database and, or any kind of uh, domain-specific uh, information, could actually do this translation and then send to the devices what they can understand. The same thing, uh, it provides uh, possibilities to extend these policies and then also uh, the data set uh, information to understand from where the decisions is being taken, how uh, the things are being operated. And then uh, this is one step just in this automation of intelligent services. So try to get machines to talk to machines, understand each other. So that is what I have. Sorry for the overtime. Thank you. Um, no, it's okay. interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think there's um, there's a few questions, and I think Karsten had a comment, and I think um, I also have a comment. Comments. So uh, we, maybe we can start with the question, which is uh, again from Paul, and then we can 
uh, move to uh, the comment from Karsten and maybe the comment from uh, Dirk uh, and so Paul, you can ask your question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, I, I think there's a lot of alignment with some of the things Leon was talking about before. My question is basically, uh, so, okay, introducing an abstraction layer to represent all the different data sets that you have is super important. Have, but one of the key purposes of doing it is for reuse. So I saw in the examples you gave, you showed how it could be applied to different areas, but have you tried to reuse those semantic descriptions for like a secondary domain after the initial example yet? Mm, and not yet. But uh, I have been thinking of examples of that, uh, but we haven't experimented yet with that uh, secondary domain, but we have uh, done pain exercises, that's what I can say. Cool, that would be interesting to know more, thanks. Okay, uh, Karsten, well, Karsten, you want to talk about your question? I think uh, Karsten and Dirk are both in the same direction, Edgar, is that, um, how is that, it's not really the network, but how can the network help here? Yeah. Uh, and I think it was a bit into what I was saying um, in the end. One of the things is like the network can be this kind of um, translator between domains. So you might have a refrigerator which have a domain uh, a specific description of what the service, I mean, what, what is the refrigerator and what services this refrigerator requires. The, the, the refrigerator will have an application. It might be, I don't know, uh, planning the food of the week for the family. Uh, and then in, the, in this planning of the food, there will be multiple steps, which are basically a pipeline of uh, different services and anatomic services. So then how you, are, first of all, acquire those models, uh, how you actually uh, get the data for, um, for a process, N not only the data that the refrigerator has, but also most probably from other devices that are over the house. So then how you actually get that data to to be processed in your refrigerator. So it has to be forwarded from somewhere. Uh, so all those uh, things are services that the network could provide. The discovery, uh, where I can find them, find this, and then you, you give your requirements. This is the type of data I can, I can um, give or I need. And then where is the service that I can use that, uh, that uh, accomplish that for me from the point of view of the player? So I think that, that those are things. And of course, the pipelining thing is in, inherent, something that could go over devices, not, not necessarily the service might be in one device, but I can think of certain pipelines that could go to the, for example, cloud and come back and then continue in the device, for example. Okay, uh, we're out of time and we still have one presentation. So thank you very much. Edgar. And Alex raised his hand. Oh, Alex. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Alex. Uh, yes, Alex, sorry. I missed you. Oops. Mute on no. yourself. You're I mute. can now hear you. You are mute. Yes, very good presentation. Interesting. One comment. The main diagram defining the architecture where you introduce a new network services is sound and good. However, there are missing elements here in order to make it usable. Number one is adaptation to the lower level environments because there will be many types of devices. Number two, very importantly, is some sort of management function to allow new network or many uh, services to be added or new functionality to be added or changed, without which the whole thing is static. Uh, and it has to be a show how it expands. And also, very importantly, to distribute, to, to define where this network service resides. Is it in a network of mini clouds or it is in uh, in one cloud or both these are the issues which need to be looked at but the question is very simple there are eight to my knowledge standardized fully developed data models which have also mapping between themselves one of it is from ietf group so for the issue is not to develop another data model because this is going to be 
more difficult than you expect, in my view, in order for acceptance. Looks to me that you already said that this is the, not the same, it's similar to others. What is needed, what, and this is my question, are the information systems which will enable data to be collected, distributed, and consumed by the network services. That's where it's missing, which is not part of a data model. It's about the use of data model for a purpose. And that's where, please provide some uh, suggestion what to do, because currently it doesn't uh, show it. Another data model does not do too much, to be honest, although it's similar to the others. Mm. Uh, I think that, I mean, you, you put several things here in, in context, and, and the one thing that is important to have in mind is not a data model. It's a taxonomy to annotate data models. So you will need data models to connect them to this. What it tried to do is um, to bring out a description of a service. And as a description of the service, you, you mentioned you need to have I mean, the environment where it's executed. We try to bring it to the highest level possible. And then that might be, that description itself, it, it, it might be uh, domain specific. So there might be a description of a refrigerator in the refrigerator domain, uh, but then might be somebody to actually describe that hardware from the perspective of the actual mi microcontrollers. And then you could have very um, equivalent uh representations so what we are trying to do is like actually trying to make possible that you can use whatever is preferred for you and use the network as the facilitator to find what is the best uh, or what are the best services that match so that you can do life cycle management of those services so exactly what you say you want to update a service so how you update it uh, and find a right match I will stop this. This uh, actually, maybe we can take again. We can take that discussion to the list because, frankly, uh, we have Radistent who's been waiting and would really Sorry. like Thank to you. have time to to present. So Radistent, um, please. Uh, okay, so Radistent is presenting a paper that he uh, already has uh, published in a conference, and uh, it is very much after ab about the implementation of uh, computing on switches and in that case multi-tenant so now we're going to we're moving from data abstractions into really hardware uh, so please radiston radiston um am i correct to say that you won the best paper award for this paper um i'm not aware of that but okay i maybe i'm confusing it with something else okay it, please it was, sorry to interrupt it, it was published about a month ago, at the beginning of ah. December. Well, thank you very much for presenting it. And, and again, um, I, I, I really, I don't know, uh, Noah is not online, but uh, thank you very much to Noah for having uh, introduced this work to us. So please, uh, Radistan, please, please present. Thank you. Um, I'll try to share my screen and see if that works. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here today and for giving me this opportunity to present our work on multi-tenant programmable switches. Um, my name is Rostin Stoyanov and I'm a recent MPhil in Advanced Computer Science graduate from University of Cambridge. And today we'll be discussing how multi-tenancy can be supported on programmable network devices. In recent years, many applications have been developed for in-network computing. Some examples include inbound network telemetry, used to collect and report network state, consensus protocols, significantly increasing throughput and reducing latency, stateful load balancers capable of replacing hundreds of software instances with a single switch, Key value stores providing high throughput and low latency with rapidly changing workloads. And machine learning models used for in network classification. Um, this type of in network applications are particularly useful because offloading software functionality to the network allows us to make available CPU cycles to user applications. 
However, today data centers are shared by many organizations that don't necessarily have the same requirements in terms of availability and security. And what if you want to run in network applications as a service? Um, while programmable data plane virtualization allows us to run multiple inter, um, in network applications simultaneously on a single network device, the coexistence of multiple tenants on a programmable switch has some additional requirements. In particular, mechanisms for security performance and resource isolation are needed to compartmentalize the network device. While multi-tenancy allows multiple users to share the same physical data plane, there are several aspects we need to consider in terms of security. When reusing memory, for example, for packet queuing, we need to ensure that one user cannot infer the data from the traffic of other users. We could allocate a part of the memory for each user or make sure that users cannot reference memory that has not been erased. Since all network packets might share the same physical pipeline, one user could impact the performance of other users on the switch by continuously cloning and recirculating packets. Therefore, we need mechanisms that enable a network operator to limit the capabilities available to user applications. Resources such as tables, registers, and counters allocated to one user should not be accessible to other users on the switch. Therefore, we need to, and we need to ensure that applications are modular and self-contained. In addition, when a user is deploying a new program on the programmable switch, the operational data plane should not be interrupted from the perspective of other users. Um, um, consider an example where Alice and Bob communicate through a programmable switch. Alice has deployed a network function that implements congestion control by looking at the queue occupancy, um, where the queue size is carried over the metadata bus. Um, Eve is an attacker that has been has deployed a malicious, malicious program, and Eve could attempt to modify the queue size on the, on the metadata bus um, by setting it to zero or maximum, which could lead to incorrect congestion control. It could also um, deploy a program that could attempt to change the header information, such as priority, and attempt um, in an attempt to cause a packet to be dropped. To prevent this type of attacks, and a network operator should be able to control what capabilities are available to user programs. The operating model of multi tenant data plane should allow a network operator to set actions before and after a user program. This approach allows not only to programmatically configure the assignment of packets to each program, but also to limit the amount of outbound tra traffic. Protocols such as VXLAN can be used to encapsulate packets to enable users to modify inner packet headers, while the outer headers are used to forward the packet to, to the correct destination device. This method can be used to abstract the underlying hardware infrastructure and provide the ability to users to perform arbitrary packet processing, for example, to modify Ethernet headers. Um, to manage a multi tenant data plane, a network administrator can, can apply rules and permissions to define the level of access available to each program. A super user role can be used to define how packets are processed before and after user programs, while a user role represents all capabilities available to, um, to user programs. In addition, a network administrator can define custom roles with specific specific set of permissions. For example, um, custom roles can be load balancer and VPN routing. While the permission to recirculate packets might be necessary for VPN routing, it may not be required for load balancers. Um, to address these requirements, we propose MTPSA multi-tenant programmable switch architecture. It extends the portable switch architecture with the ability to support multiple users that provide a super user pipe and provides a super user pipeline. The super user pipeline enables processing before and after a user program. It can be used to programmatically associate incoming packets with user programs and to apply packet encapsulation or other operations on the incoming and outgoing traffic, such as 
limiting the input and output ports available to a user program. Um, we implement the prototype of MTPSA on the PSA BMV2 software switch using the P4 Seek fiber. And as you can see, a super user program is used to define the ingress and egress pipelines, while user programs are similar to the simple assuming switch architecture. They consist of programmable parser, match action control block, and a parser. The super user ingress pipeline assigns user identifier to each packet. It corresponds to a switch context where the user program is installed. By default, the user identifier is set to zero and the context corresponding to this value is reserved as a control context. Control context is used to process unexpected packets, for example, when no programs have been installed or the received packet cannot be associated with any user. The ingress pipeline can also be used to programmatically um, set permissions to each packet using the standard metadata bus. The MTPSA target is using the val this value to limit the capabilities available to the program that is processing the packets. The ingress pipeline can also apply packet encapsulation by adding outer headers to the packet. Um, this approach allows us to provide information such as user identifier to other devices within the network. The egress parser is applied to packets before the user pipeline and enables packet encapsulation transparent to user program by extracting the outer headers of the packet. The egress match action tables and the parser are applied after the user pipeline and can be used to process the outgoing packet before it is being sent out to the output queues. This method allows us to remove the encapsulation headers before sending the packet to the destination server or virtual machine. Um, to evaluate the hardware feasibility of MTPSA, we implement the prototype on the NetPJ Sumi platform using the Xilinx P4 SDNet compiler. Um, this prototype allows us to measure the packet latency, throughput, and the amount of allocated hardware resources. <coughs> um, it currently supports eight user programs, and it can be extended. For simplicity, the user programs are installed between ingress and egress pipelines, and we use 128-bit metadata bus, from which only 40 bits are made available to user programs. Um, our evaluation results um, show that MTPSA scales with the number of users and allows users to define programs with different complexity without affecting the packet latency of other users. In summary, we propose a methodology for multi-tenancy and programmable data plane, data plane virtualization, providing performance, security, and risk and resource installation capable of processing packets at line rate. Our implementation is open source and available on GitHub. Um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Radistin. Um, is there a question? Um... I think uh, for the people on, on this group who are not too familiar with, with P4, actually we've had a a really wide range of topics today, which is good. Um, for people who are not too familiar for with P4, uh, can you tell why uh, multi-tenancy has not that much been used in P4, especially if you consider uh, the problems that are related to uh, security, encryption, all of these things? Um, I think it's because it's still an early project. Um, the language itself, has um, the P416 version, which was um, which is still in development, and um, the portable switch architecture PSA is also a new proposal. Um, the specification itself and uh, the new work that is coming up, the portable NIC architecture, is also very interesting. Um, I think um, there are a few papers about discussing how virtualiz virtualization can be supported. And this is basically divided into three, three categories. So the first category is uh, at compiler level, 
Um, this is very common, actually. Um, basically, to be able to merge multiple programs um, together and then deploy them on um, a normal switch, like the Fino switch. Um, the second category is a hypervisor based, where there is a specific um, P4 program that can basically do everything, but it can be configured through the match action tables. So um, basically, this, this approach is using a special compiler that transforms the P4 program into a configuration that can be deployed at runtime. And the last one is basically when we have an architecture that supports um, multi tenancy. The difference is um, basically the first two approaches don't actually provide performance isolation. So if you merge a large program with a small one, um, the latency will be the same for both of them. Um, but I, <clears throat> the second approach has downside that it consumes a lot of resources, even though um, not everything is being used. And the architecture approach is still something new. Um, does this answer your question? Yeah, I'm on mute because it seems somebody's doing some repairs upstairs and now I don't hear myself. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, um, we still have a few minutes. Do you you hear that noise behind? Well, if they stop there, I think they're sanding the floors. <laughs> no um, worries. Uh, whatever, it, it's a nice background information. Um, I can take just a few seconds to talk about the, uh, the NSF uh, workshop. Um, I can share some, I can share at least the picture that we had. Um, so, um, please, please stop sanding the floors. Um, so essentially I just wanted to tell this group that, uh, we had, uh, with again, Henning schulz of, uh, Columbia University, these, um, um, three workshops in November, um, we went across the U S, uh, elections, which was interesting, uh, where we looked at the future of research in broadband. And um, NSF does that uh, every four years uh, to see where the, where three, four or five years to see what is the status of research uh, in broadband. Uh, we had uh, three workshops, one on technology, one on economics and one on digital inclusion. And of course, for this group, it's mostly the technology part that is uh, important. Um, I have to say that the, the report is being published. It's going to be public. So when it is uh, issued, I will make sure to post the, the link to this group. Um, so I think in the technology world, if I can summarize, um, by maybe two words, it was data and metrics. And both of them are related to uh, a little bit of what's been said today and is going is being addressed in this group. Um, there was a recognition that, uh, you know, that there's not that much broadband research as there was before. And a lot of it has been uh, allotted to like optimizing data centers and uh, making sure that you know, cloud infrastructure works well, but that there could be um, other uh, interesting approaches as we go into more uh, in artificial intelligence and networks, and as also broadband is more and more wireless and not, uh, and not wired. Um, we had in our group of panelists, which were um, invited, uh, the people from um, Princeton, uh, the group from Jennifer, Redford, Rexford, who uh, are doing a lot of in-network computing. So there was a little bit of a, um, I would say, a, um, a discussion about the use of in-network computing. There was also the idea that there's a lot of new satellite networks that are going up 
And these satellite networks will be connected also to uh, data collection, data distribution, and computing centers. So that was actually also part of the discussion. And who talks data talks also metrics, uh, the metrics needed uh, to uh, actually uh, direct the data acquisition and the metrics that are used to evaluate the data. Um, so there was, strangely enough, not a lot of discussion and I would say fundamental um, network research in terms of what has happened in the fa in the past, like, you know, in terms of more advanced antennas and stuff like that. But there was a lot about, uh, again, how broadband research and network research in particular is moving to be very much data oriented and to a lesser extent, but also related to uh, the topics that were addressed uh, by our colleagues in economics and in digital inclusion, uh, this aspect of broadband not now just just not being uh, having a fiber industry, but how people can actually use that fiber, which of course uh, is being now experienced by everybody on this call uh, that we're working from home. And I have a lot of broadband, but I have some standing upstairs. So how do you deal with all the socioeconomic and geographical relations to access to broadband? I don't want to do more than that uh, because we're uh, running out of time. Um, we're going to meet uh, at the IETF. Uh, our our um, meeting is in the last session of the Friday, which I think is afternoon for me. It's probably middle of the night in Asia and uh, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, probably California this time is, is, in, a good, is in a good shape. Uh, we're going to have the same type of format that we had today, which is uh, research papers or research updates. And if I have a better update on, on the NSF, I'm going to, uh, I think the, the, the report should be ready by then. Uh, and again, if you have uh, presentations, we've already had uh, two uh, people asking for presentation. Um, and we're, go we're obviously asking for, uh, for more. Again, we're not going to concentrate on the drafts. We would love, however, to remind some people on this call that your drafts are expired. And so please uh, decide what you want to do with them and um, move again the discussions on, uh, on drafts to the list. Uh, this was the, our, like some kind of our first trial at, at doing this more into like a um, technical meeting of some sorts. And again, I think we'll have to uh, sort out uh, how we want to continue that model, but I think it's it's what we decided would be the most research in the IRTF and, and a little bit less a bunch of drafts presentations, which we've been very lucky because we have a lot of them. But again, this is for research and, and we want to really focus on that. And so, then just uh, say, even, I, I even Jeff, say, yeah, please, please, yeah. I was going to say, even, and Jeff, please add uh, what you... What I wanted to say was that, um, you know, we recognize that there's probably some balance um, between all drafts or all research proposals. And so ideas around how to um, uh, organize would be very well um, appreciated. I, in particular, like sitting here, you know, as we um, ask each of the um, presenters, you know, like how does this re revert or relate back to CoinRG or maybe, you know, having dedicated uh, sessions to a particular topic or part of the architectural space or, um, you know, focusing in on the different flavors of compute in the network. So, you know, organizing principles like that. So we're absolutely open to, um, you know, best practices or uh, requests that you might have um, to help us, uh, you know, balance the, the dynamic in the group towards the pragmatics of drafts versus the how do we progress the area and really work towards our objective to um, organize the research group um, going forward or whether that organization means scoping it differently um, or directing it in some uh, new way. So 
your ideas are very much appreciated and solicited. Um, Jeff, you want to add something? I, yeah, I think we can discuss after this meeting and also welcome uh, the participants in the group can feedback to us how we organize better. Yeah, um, again, I think we're, we're, we're finding our, our footing our here. Way. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, we, we, we tried to uh, take into account uh, a lot of the comments we've had before, but obviously new comments are also welcome. So uh, we're going to finish on time, which is really great. I would like to thank uh, all the presenters, uh, Alex, uh, Leon, and Paul, um, Edgar, and Radastan uh, for their efforts in helping us put this together. Uh, we will, of course, uh, produce some minutes when they're finished doing the sanding upstairs. And, um, oh my God, this is horrible. And uh, we will uh, hopefully see you virtually on uh, March 12th. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And meet you in ITF, next ITF meeting. It wasn't so bad, the sanding. Oh uh, yeah, it's because you're not you're not in it. I know, yeah. I know. To those on the other end, I can assure. I mean, just to tell yeah, you, it was, it was worse. It was worse for you than it was for for us. I think. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's Actually, quite musical think, sounding uh, for us. Yeah. Uh, they've they've reopened um, some stores now. Everything was closed for since December twenty fourth, and I think I'm just going to. Uh, to go do some shopping while they're doing that because you know I won't be able to work here. This is terrible. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully, I figured out uh, Colin and Eve and company. You know that it's been a year since we actually met in person. Uh, I, I guess it must be. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. crazy, isn't it? Yeah. The next one's not going to happen, is it? I mean, the one in. No, it's not. San Francisco. It's sadly. And, and Philip, uh, Philip, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but the British, the British, well, Colin, you were in the British Isles too. Uh, the British uh, version of this uh, being now propagating through North America, um, I'm not very confident about the fall one either. I, I have to plan a move from my apartment in Boston to, to here. And I, at this point, I would, it's going to cost me hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to take tests and uh, oh, clear, clear stuff from one place to another. And I'm waiting because anyway, I have until June 1st to do that. But I have an impression at the end, the only thing I'll be able to do is to send a company in my apartment in Boston. They're going to pack everything and send it here because I don't know when I'm going to be able to go. It's just completely, it's just completely crazy. Yeah, it's not, good. it's not good. So, Colin, we would especially um, uh, appreciate your wisdom about, um, you know, uh, how to take the this idea of um, research discussion and maybe even more pointed um, research discussion where we cluster some of the topics yeah, into we, different I, meetings. Actually, Having themed uh, themed meeting could be good. I think today yeah. we, we were we touched about four teams. Yeah, I thought it was like fascinating. Each one, them, each one of them could be a different team, but yeah, we, we I think it's a good it's a, would be a really good idea. And you know, maybe there's also um, a small set of um, questions that we ask our speakers 